We begin in the name of God. Greetings. Welcome to another session of From the Desk of Gramdi. The series of discussions continues in the 23rd question series. Today, we are beginning the 165th episode of this series. What is Hadith? This topic is under discussion. Let us begin the 31st session on this topic. Ramdi Sahab, the fundamental objection raised by the ulama was about the meaning of bayan. It was said that this was the official responsibility of the Prophet. Those Quranic verses are under discussion. What does the word bayan mean? Does it include the meanings of modification, change or alteration? Similarly, does it include restriction, exception, limitation or abrogation? All those 10 verses of the Quran were discussed where the word bayan itself was used. In what aspects was it used? What do our previous commentators say? And how has Islamic scholarship approached this topic? Ramdi Sahab, after listening to all this, the conclusion is that if we accept your position that all these aspects are not part of the bayan, then based on the corpus of hadith that reaches us with its attribution to the Prophet peace, be upon him, we observe a different situation. There the Prophet of God made changes, modifications and specified and limited the commandments of the Quran. And similarly, there has been abrogation of some verses as well. There are countless examples of this. And on many occasions, Gramdi Sahab has presented a detailed stance in his books and discussions. I will present a few examples here. People can refer to them in their original context. Some examples have been continuously discussed in this series. Others will be covered in future sessions. For example, the Prophet of God forbade the consumption of wild animals and birds. A man mustn't marry a niece and her aunt together. Similarly, while he disallowed carrion, he permitted the consumption of dead fish. A disbeliever cannot inherit from a believer, and the punishment for theft has been established. Likewise, regarding the punishment of stoning, the point stated in the Quran was added to it. There are many examples, Khamdi Sahab. We have discussed them in detail, and some, inshallah, will be discussed separately, like the case of stoning. However, I would like to discuss four hadiths as case studies in this session, which are used to prove that these hadiths completely go against that concept of bayan, which Ghamdi Sahab himself advances. Ghamdi Sahab, the first example we are discussing today is Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 222. I will read the verse. They ask you concerning menstruation. Say, it is an impure thing, so keep away from women during menstruation and do not approach them until they are clean. In this verse, the words keep away from women during menstruation are used, that is, stay away from your wives. The Quran commanded separation without specifying its extent. It did not mention keeping your wives in a separate place or refraining from eating and drinking with them or anything of the sort. The Hadith clarified this point stating that during this time, physical relations, that is sexual relations, are prohibited. What does Gamdi Sahab say? The Quran speaks of a general matter. When the Prophet elaborates, he transforms an absolute statement as something particular. Before I discuss this verse, I will draw your attention to a few points. The first point is the responsibility assigned by God to the Prophet and what was not assigned. This entire discussion relates to the verses of the Quran. Wherever the Quran has addressed them, we have discussed them in detail before and in this series also. The previous discussion focused on a specific verse from Surah An-Nahl. It is the only verse usually cited. Both interpretations have been present among our past scholars. We have encountered these scholars' opinions. We analyzed it in detail. After that, a criticism followed, which was that when the Quran itself claims that some things were being explained, there was a transformation or an alteration made therein, or some specification or limitation has been imposed. All these things bring about a change in the purport of the original passage. We analyzed every example and concluded that none of those verse involved such a transformation. Concerning the Quran, we reached the point of completion. Now, examining another aspect, let us also consider the hadiths which have been attributed to the Prophet. I have discussed this principle at many places. In my book Mizan, under the topic of fundamental principles, this whole discussion appears. It is stated that the religion God has given us, whether it is mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah, then either these isolated reports which have been attributed to the Prophet will describe the prophetic example, 
or they will engage in understanding and clarification. We have explained what this understanding and clarification is. When something already present is clarified, its implications are unfolded. These implications may be linguistic or rational. Considering these, we explained all the examples. Hence, in light of this need, whenever I have spoken on this topic, whether in my books or on any other occasion, these examples have always come up for discussion. In my book, when I discuss this subject of fundamental principles, I took six examples and clarified their reality. I advise my listeners to refer to them. They can read it as it is already available in text form. They can even listen to them as the topic has been lectured upon also. The relationship between understanding and clarification of the Quran and the Prophet's statements, peace be upon him, has been clarified there. The arguments for this are given there. Both linguistic and rational arguments are given. All these details can be found there. You have correctly said that it is possible that some matters among them can still be debated and objections may still be raised. Among them, the punishment for stoning remains under discussion. There is a need for separate discussion on it, which we will address in this series. However, other examples have been discussed from various perspectives. If any doubt arises, we will make it a separate topic. The examples you have selected now, you may present them one by one, and I will explain in the same way. That is, just as we have elaborated with respects to things in the Quran. That how is the point stated, how it is understood, what are its implications, and how they are extrapolated. First, you gave an example of a command related to menstruation. This commandment is stated in verse 222 of Surah Al-Baqarah. I think the objectors may not have read the entire verse. Really? If you read it from start to finish, its purport becomes absolutely clear. When something is said, I have often reminded you to consider what word is used. You will examine the sentence, context, and background. You would recall that in this surah, the command to slaughter the cow was given to the Israelites. We discussed it earlier. Although in Antazbahu Bakara, the word Bakara is used as indefinite, it is not indefinite because the context indicates that the sacrificial cow is meant by it. The concept of sacrifice implies some particular aspects as regards the sacrificial cow. Look at this verse. Reading it from start to end reveals its clarity. No Quran student would think all relations are being asked to be severed. It will be absolutely clear that the discussion concerns the relationship between man and wife. Listen, it is said. The complete verse is, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيضِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ فَاعْتَزِلُوا النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيضِ وَلَا تَقْرَبُوهُنَّ حَتَّى يَطْهُرْنَ فَإِذَا تَطَهَّرْنَ فَأْتُوهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَمَرَكُمُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ وَيُحِبُّ الْمُتَطَهِّرِينَ نِسَاءُكُمْ حَرْثٌ لَكُمْ فَأْتُوا حَرْثَكُمْ أَنَّا شِئْتُمْ وَقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ مُلَاقُوهُ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ this is the complete verse. Listen to the translation. They ask you about menstruating women. Say, it is a kind of impurity, so stay away from women during menstruation until they are cleansed of blood. Here the words are avoided. Once they bathe and are purified, approach them from the way that God has commanded. Strange, okay? The words made clear what was intended by avoid. And what approach means? Certainly, God loves those who repent and purify themselves. If there remained any confusion, then listen further. Your wives are your fields. Hence, approach your fields as you wish and prepare for yourselves the life of this world and the hereafter and fear God. And know that one day you shall meet him and give glad tidings to the believers, O Prophet, of this auspicious meeting. This is the whole verse. The Quran explained in detail that these women are like fields you approach them to produce offspring. For this meeting, God set a natural law. You can read it in the book of Fitra. When menstruating, do not approach them. And when it ends, after purification, meet them as God commanded. Hence, the argument is not about not shaking hands, talking or seeing them. This is not under discussion. The matter at hand is the relationship concerning intimacy between man and wife 
which the Quran itself has gradually explained. The entire commandment has been stated about this. Hence, one can only express awe at the suggestion that the Quran did not provide any details. No, it has described it. And if any further clarification was required, the Prophet explained it. Even better, he made a point clear through his actions. This is what the Prophets do. This is also what the scholars do. Indeed, Ramdi Sahab, this point is very clear. As soon as one reads the text of the Quran, it becomes evident as a matter of fact what the intended message is, which is commonly misunderstood. I wish to speak a bit more on this matter. Either the inability to understand the style of the Quran's language leads to such confusion because nowhere is it written explicitly, O oh brother, do not establish an intimate relationship. It was said to meet in the manner God commanded. The language poses obstruction. Another point is that if the Prophet clarified something on an occasion, then we must examine what issue had arisen. It is possible that a person misunderstood these matters and had questioned about them. Cultural norms are present as we know in various societies, and even in the days of Islam, different restrictions were placed on women during the menstruating days. Thus, the Prophet of God stated what was already present in the Quran. There was no alteration or addition. This is how it works. The Quran uses the language of literature, a very sophisticated form of expression. Unfortunately, this issue arises with us and also among the flag bearers of atheism. They read a literary text the same way they read a book of history or geography. When you study a literary work, it has its own language, its own styles. The context must be considered to understand the message. Sometimes the point is conveyed indirectly. Sometimes a comparison is used for clarification. In some places, the context itself clarifies the matter without it being explicitly stated. Therefore, whoever reads it, if they have a taste for the language and can comprehend the content, they will easily conclude that the subject in question truly pertains to the intimacy between husband and wife. This is what is meant when it says to avoid. When the period of impurity ends and women have purified themselves, then approach them. The question arises, when meeting someone under normal circumstances, is there a prescribed method by God? Such meetings happen naturally as we wish. We meet, we go out, sit together, eat and do whatever we want. Whereas, that was the type of meeting God Almighty guided us on how to approach intimacy. Much has been written in the Book of Fitra about it, drawing our attention to it. It has been said that since women experience a kind of impurity and keeping away from impurity is a requirement of our religion, this relationship should not be established at that time. Hence, no one could even imagine imposing such extreme prohibitions like forbidding contact altogether. When I hear such objections or see these types of questions, I can only think of what the Persian poet said when he wrote, Who took my poetry and placed it before a religious cleric from a seminary? who has no understanding of literature, language, or how discourse is constructed and interpreted? I would like to discuss a delicate aspect in the context of this example. It has been said that the Quran had mentioned absolutely to stay away from women during menstruation. Could it not have included all sorts of restrictions like stopping eating and drinking together, ending social interactions, severing relationships, or even leaving the house? There was no prohibition. At least the hadith came and specified that only physical intimacy should be avoided during this period. What picture emerges from God's words? That is, without any clarification, a statement was made that contained numerous possibilities. The Prophet clarified that certain possibilities, as the Quran itself suggests, would be unjust or discriminatory. How can one isolate a person with whom God has established a cycle? How can one savor contact, deny them food and drink, or throw them out of the house? This is what the hadith aimed to convey, aligning the discourse with logic, explaining that it is a matter of societal norms. So, where does this place the discourse of God? Right where it belongs, and where objections arise when placed thereat. That is, what is the grandeur of this language? How does it speak? What are its literary styles? How do expressions emerge? How it employs idiom? What are the methods of articulating them? How some part of the sentence is often left for the listener or reader to infer? How should it be understood? 
Instead of cultivating an appreciation for this in our religious institutions, we focus on proving things in a particular manner which has its consequences. Consequently, it is reiterated that the Qur'an should be understood in the way it deserves to be understood, meaning one should delve deeply into the words, analyze the sentences, and place them in their proper context to grasp the issue. In our Urdu language, when we use certain words in a specific context, such as, now you can meet with women, anyone familiar with Urdu understands what is meant by meet. That is, such expressions are used in Urdu as well. And all other languages. They exist in all languages. How are they used? In speaking, modesty and decorum are maintained, and this is seen in every language around the world. It is a different matter that, in certain instances, we resort to direct expressions. However, the Quran speaks plainly when no alternative exists. Otherwise, the usual method for expressing such things is the same. Here, the same method was adopted. It was said that, approach your wives, God will provide you with children. This is a significant blessing that has been bestowed upon you. To achieve it, you must endeavor and strive. God will accept your efforts. Thus, all of this is easily understood from the Qur'an. There is no hesitation at all. If there is a need to refer to a hadith, whatever has been stated in the hadith is entirely consistent with our understanding of the Qur'an. The point is now clear. Has the statement of the Qur'an and its instructions been altered, diversified, limited, specified, or abrogated by the Prophet's peace be upon him statement? As a case study, I am presenting four examples to you, Ghamdi Sahab. The second example concerns Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 275, Ahallahu al-bay'a wa harrama al-riba. God has permitted trade and prohibited usury. It is said that trade is a general term that includes all types of buying and selling. However, a hadith transmitted by Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu anha states that the Prophet said, Indeed, God and his messenger have prohibited the trade of alcohol, dead animals, pigs, and idols. Thus, the Quran had permitted all forms of trade using a general word. But the Prophet specified certain items as prohibited. What do you say? Was the general guidance of the Qur'an specified by this hadith? The guidance of the Qur'an which is referenced here, but no effort to understand it was expended. There, the topic was not about which things are lawful and unlawful. Rather, the verse quoted was not a direct statement from God. Wow, really? It was quoted as an objection from others. For example, in the Qur'an, you will find various places where it is mentioned that when a daughter is born, these people say such things. It is mentioned in Surah Az-Zukruf that they say, Who has been born in our house? She cannot play any role in the council. She will only be nurtured in jewelry. Many such statements and opinions are quoted as objections made by others. When they are raising their objections, they might make statements of this sort, and this has been quoted by the Qur'an. Now, it turns out that there is nothing really wrong with the statement, but at least we must correctly understand what is being said. What is its context? There is no specific command from God regarding trade and transactions in this context. That is the first point. If we take what has been stated at face value, the issue is not simply about distinguishing between what is halal, permissible, and haram, forbidden. What is the issue then? The discussion revolves around the fact that God Almighty has permitted trade and business transactions. We know that the entire world's economic system relies on buying and selling. It is a fundamental aspect of business and trade. However, one element within this system is interest. What is interest? It is the charge for lending money, that is, a demand for a return on a loan. God Almighty has prohibited interest. We have discussed the reason for this prohibition many times. When you lend to your brother, it is considered a good and virtuous deed. If you lend, then simply lend without expecting interest, as lending money is not a business transaction. Therefore, you should desist from trying to turn a profit on lending this kind of help. This principle has been established by God Almighty. In response, some have questioned this distinction saying they do not understand why God has permitted trade but prohibited interest. In trade, 
We exchange goods and earn profits, so what is wrong with earning a profit by lending money? This objection is mentioned in the Quran. In this context, it is said that the distinction is clear. Here the objection you were citing isn't being discussed in the first place. Now I will recite the verse for you. Listen to what it says. God Almighty begins the verse with الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِّ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الرِّبَا وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الرِّبَا فَمَنْ جَاءَهُ مَوْعِظَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِ فَانْتَهَى فَلَهُ مَا سَلَفَ وَأَمْرُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ عَادَ فَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ This was the verse. Now listen to its translation. Now let's look at the translation. It states that those who take interest will rise on the day of judgment like a person driven mad by Satan's touch. This is because they claim that trade is just like interest. In other words, they are not ready to accept the difference between trade and interest. They argue that in the end, both involve earning a profit. It is surprising to them that God has made trade permissible and interest forbidden. Their argument has been quoted, leaving no doubt about the prohibition of interest. So, if someone has received guidance from their Lord and stopped dealing with interest, there will be no action against what has already been taken, and the matter is in God's hands. However, those who continue even after receiving this warning are the people of hell, and they will remain in it forever. The main point here is that this statement has been quoted as a narrative. When people are told that God has declared interest haram, they respond by saying that trade is permissible. This prompts a discussion on why one is forbidden and the other is not. Some people compare interest to rent or argue on the basis of trade. The response is clear. God has declared interest haram for a reason, though that reason is not our primary focus here. The verse affirms that trade is halal, but what does that mean? It means that the act of trading is permissible. However, this verse is not addressing which specific types of trade are halal or haram, nor is it discussing whether certain transactions should or should not be carried out. Neither the speaker nor the verse's content covers these points. These discussions show that people in our society have been taught various things, but the Quran itself has not been taught comprehensively. The point becomes clear, Ghamdi Sahab. There is a simple example. In ordinary situations, if we tell a boy or girl that one can drive on a road, the necessary rules and conditions, such as the need for a license or speed limits, are detailed elsewhere, not in this specific teaching. Ghamdi Sahab, please explain that when God Almighty states something in a specific manner, He often provides reasons in other verses for why certain things are halal or haram. For example, in Surah Al-Araf, God has specified these reasons. To understand the criteria for certain matters, one must look to these other narrations. That is when God has specifically addressed the topic. But here, that has not been done. For instance, if God had mentioned this in the same way as some people interpret it as an explanation for lawful trade, then too, it would have been about the permissibility of trade. It is not about selling something at a profit. It is about understanding the nature of trade itself and the ethical principles behind it. There are various verses in the Quran that outline principles regarding economic transactions, such as, do not consume interest, la ta'akulu al-riba, and do not consume one another's wealth unjustly, la ta'akulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil. Similarly, it has also been stated, tawanu ala al-birri wa taqwa, the context of lawful and unlawful activities is discussed extensively across different surahs, such as Surah Al-Araf, where ethical guidelines and prohibitions are specified. Here it is not the place to discuss this. The author doesn't intend to bring this up. Here the context is entirely different. Regarding the last example, Gramdi Sahab, it has been argued that the Quran mentioned that trade as a general term Yet scholars give their verdicts every day prohibit certain activities like forex trading or buying and selling Bitcoin based on interpretations. Some say 
The Quran had given a general ruling, but the Hadith specified it, and the scholars further classified it. Then, shall we say that the scholars are altering the Quran every day? No. This does not mean the scholars are changing the Quran. They are interpreting the principles based on what is written elsewhere in the Quran. What is being discussed here is something entirely different. Now, people can remove it from its context and create any meaning in it as they like. Unfortunately, these kinds of interpretations of atomistic verses of the Quran are highly regrettable. The point has now been made clear. Regarding the collection of hadith related to the Prophet peace be upon him, is there any evidence of change, addition, alteration or specification with respect to verses of the Quran? We discussed two verses today. We will address the other verses soon, inshallah. Our time is running out. We shall reconvene for further discussion. Thank you for your attention so far. Thank <laughs> you.